Hey guys, it's me, Corval Rock Bites here. We've got a great show for you today. We got the real top G, Alex from Syscoin. Of course, Austin Ramped, our in house G at Block Bites. And we're going to be covering what's going on with Rolux. Uh, it's a new roll up for Bitcoin. We're also going to be talking about the FOMC market watch, the latest ruling in the Binance case, and the big bombshell. Everyone wants to know about it the Hindman documents. So get informed. Stick around, folks. We got a great show for you. Mikey, take me into the rest of the show, man. All right, all right. We have comments. Let's welcome Alex first. Alex, welcome, welcome before we go off topic because we're going to start off topic. I'm going to tell you all right now. We're starting off topic. Alex from Cisco, thank you so much for being here, buddy. You and I were actually, we were on Wendy's show a while back. That's where I met Alex. And yeah, that was fun. You guys are old he's friends. A, he's a real one. So we're going to have to go way back. Today. Yeah. So, all right. A couple of things. Mikey, why didn't, why didn't we put the, the, why didn't we start with the thumbnail, dude? Like it threw me off completely. I, I We're going to talk I, about this live. We're going I live. Said, We're talking about I it. I said right before we literally came on that there's not going to be a thumbnail. <laughs> he did say that. My God. He All did right. say I'm that. pulling you back off. Give me, All right. Give me All right. <laughs> and then secondly, you starting the music did not fix the mic. We know that there's microphone issues. Like really? The beginning. Didn't fix it. Did dude, that was my it. best intro. Yeah. You guys didn't even hear it. Dude, it was so it was super fire. No, I heard it. it. Got, so much, got my nipples hard, bro. It was so okay, good. freaking good. As long as it's sexually aroused, Austin, I guess we're good. <laughs> so so I want to tell you, after our last show that we did, and we were way off topic, there was like one or two YouTube comments which were like, ah, you guys suck. You're I didn't like it. So so my response to that is we're doubling down on the level of insanity that we're going to bring during this show. <laughs> Why did we got Alex own, here? My own team trolls me in the comments. Uh, we're doubling down on the level of insanity that we're doing during this show. Cause we have so much good shit to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just fired up. I'm fired up. Oh, yeah. And if you don't like it, go watch somebody else. This is fun. <laughs> we're, so we're I haven't been on a show with you before. Uh, and our audience might not. Could you give us like a little introduction, man? Syscoin, I know that. Well, uh, me personally introduction or Syscoin introduction? Dude, I want to hear about you personally. It's all about you, man. Me, well, I'm, I'm the self-proclaimed Syscoin top G, kind of like oh, the in-house yeah. G, Austin. Uh, I've been in <laughs> blockchain for what, like five years now and uh, joined the Syscoin team about a year and a half ago. Always been a big fan of what they're doing, uh, what they're building, and it, all roads kind of lead up to where we're at right now. And it's just uh, very exciting, uh, very happy to be in this space and just continue to grow. Awesome, dude. I like that. Oh, yeah. That was a... Right, uh... so let me tell i want to tell a little story i don't even remember i don't even remember how i found okay. rolux honestly but so you guys all know we've got ordinal madness over on bitcoin and and you know the the benefit it. of a layer two let's say on ethereum for example for anyone that's not familiar is you get the speed and you get the trans like the pricing of a transaction the gas fees are low you get very fast speed cheap transactions, but you get the security of the main network because what it's doing is it's taking your transactions, batching them and sending them back to Ethereum, right? So you kind of get the best of both worlds from a scalability standpoint. But Bitcoin is truly the most secure network. It's not Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum is fairly decentralized, also proof of stake. If AWS ever got a wild hair up their ass, they would have a problem. Um, but Bitcoin really truly is the most secure network in the world. And so I forget how I found you guys, man, but somebody referred me over to the, the Rolex Twitter and it's a, it's a layer two EVM compatible layer two built on, I mean, it's not built on Bitcoin, but you, I assuming you're, you're confirming the transactions back over on the Bitcoin chain is how this is working. Yes. Can yeah. you, can you break this down, Alex? Yeah, this yeah, absolutely. Very intriguing. So when, when we build the principle of how we build is with scalability in mind, right? And, and if the whole world, can't use your blockchain like what's the point point? and let's mm -hmm. be honest you've got all these like cute ideas you got like dag technology delegated proof of stake you got different programming languages all the help but at the end of the day like most of these popular 
coins that are still popular and technologies, you know, it's, it's really because there's a lot of money pumped into it. <laughs> and right. I don't really think that we've reached that point in adoption where scalability is yet to be tested. And anytime you get anywhere near close, uh, you got the blockchain either turning off or gas fees just going through the roof, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the two most revolutionary technologies at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be Bitcoin, gold standard for security. And then you've got Ethereum, which has essentially uh, introduced programmability to money, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's where we're at right now. Um, what we're doing with Syscoin is combining both of those components and being able to use the modular design in order to be able to scale to those limits. So now you have all these layer twos and Rolex is another one uh, that we have built, which has EVM compatibility. But what we do that's a little bit unique and different or a lot unique and different, not many people or not many mm -hmm. do this, we're merge bind with Bitcoin. So basically mm. we're taking Bitcoin's proof of work hash and applying it to the Syscoin blockchain. And that's how we're able to inherit that security. Shut your face. Whoa. So like, all right, so <laughs> who else? And so I know like, and all it's right. it's proof so of work. It's proof of work, it, most importantly. That's actually a really, really important topic mm -hmm. because I have this sneaking suspicion when it comes to the SEC that they're trying to find a way to infiltrate proof of stake. Like if they can find a way to frame up proof of stake enough towards a security, they can basically blanket classify all of these different chains. Whereas when it becomes, you know, with proof of work, like I, I, I got into mining for quite a, quite a long time, actually, but I was mining Ethereum and other things with GPUs. But let's say, you know, let's say 99% of the miners of the Bitcoin chain go offline, right? And ASICs are no longer a thing. I could hook up this little GPU I've got right back here, put it on the correct algorithm and keep the chain going. And that's decentralized. Like that's decentralized. That's actually what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's interesting. So a question that I have, the merge mining thing is very interesting, but like when I think of, okay, so Arbitrum, you know, all right. So Arbitrum has a bunch of transactions going on. They're printing these back to the Ethereum chain. Now, mm -hmm. excuse my ignorance with this question, because I know it might sound ignorant, but it's something that is like, I'm interested in. There's no ignorant question. Right? <laughs> okay. The structure of transactions on Ethereum being that there's smart contracts and other things that do not currently exist on Bitcoin are obviously different. Um, and so how are these transactions being secured back? Is it, is it just, it's simply the data you're just writing data into a block on, on, on Bitcoin chain or how's that working? Yeah. So essentially the miners from Bitcoin are securing the Syscoin network with, by just mining Bitcoin. It's like simultaneous mining, no extra work is put into it. And the way that we have things running is you have the EVM equivalent side, the Ethereum equivalent side, and then the Bitcoin merge mining, it's all going side by side. So anything mm. that's happening, whether it's on our layer one, layer two, layer three, it all goes back to layer one. And you have to think of layer one as like that court system of data, and it's all being secured there. This is rad. This is rad. And I think I read somewhere. So as far as the gas on the EVM, is that Syscoin? Yeah, the gas is actually extremely cheap, uh, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny. See, the thing is, you know, Ethereum realized they have to go modular if they want to be able to scale to the masses. Mm -hmm. And you could say, OK, great, we're all just going to build layer twos and top of Ethereum and we'll be happy. We'll be able to scale the world. It doesn't necessarily work that way. A lot of people, well, I'll say a lot of the retail, just casual investor they don't think about the data availability problem. And that's probably something that the audience really needs to know because that's going to start coming up in the future. It feels like only the developers really pay attention to that. Um, and what that means mm -hmm. is that all these rollups, like you said, Austin, they're posting that data into the layer one. And that's how it's able to scale and go really fast and inherit the security of that layer one, which should be the court system, right? But what's mm -hmm. going to happen over time is it gets just boggled down. And when you have to prove that that data is legit to call those contracts, to call that information, it's going to start adding up. And people mm -hmm. are still using Ethereum. That's the other problem. It's like Ethereum's running into this weird problem where they might have to de-incentivize usage into the layer one. 
and then say, mm. push everyone over to the layer two. So the problem there is that now you might be dealing with rising fees, boggled networks, even on rollups with Ethereum. That's why they're working on this sharding, protodank sharding, EIP 4844, whatever. Mm -hmm. Us, on the other hand, we created the layer one purposely to de-incentivize usage there and make it more as like a court settlement thing. That's why, we, that's why we keep it, that's why we keep it lightweight. Block times are every two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Then you scale on the layer two. And we have that data availability solution. We're the only one with that data availability solution on the layer one. So it's completely decentralized. And uh, that's what's given us the advantage right now on top of being secured by Bitcoin. So uh, you could see those gas fees stay cheap, remain cheap like forever. We're always, we always got that future proof mm -hmm. mindset. Cool. So let's say, I mean, we got some questions here in the chat. So we want to get the flow of a transaction here. So I'm on Rolux and I submit a transaction. How is that being, how, how, where does that pass through? Like, where does it go from there? I submit my transaction. It's hitting Rolux, right? Getting processed right. through Rolux. How does that interact with Bitcoin? If it's right. not being so you, rolled so, up into the Yeah, Bitcoin essentially block. you roll up the transaction, right? There's two, two second block times. And then those get packaged in, pretend it's like a shipping container or something, mm -hmm. and we're shipping it from Rolex Island L2 to the L1 mainland, right? Okay. And that L1 mainland is the hub where the Bitcoin security lies because those miners are securing the network through the merge mining process. Okay. Can we think of this like, I mean, you guys have... In some way, shape, or form, this is using the optimism tech. Is that correct? Yes. So the reason why we decided to go with optimism is because they're kind of the most ready. And we're really big on ZK technology. I think it's great for privacy, you know, zero knowledge proofs and everything. Uh, that's a whole nother freaking math equation that I cannot explain to you. I, funny story. I went to like a ZK school. They were offering like a free thing in Berkeley. And I went to like the first two classes. I was like, what the fudge is this? <laughs> like the provers, the verifiers, the polynomial numbers. I was like, yes, I ain't, I ain't cut out for this stuff. <laughs> uh, but I did learn a little bit. ZK technology is the way to go, but it's very resource intensive. And it's going to take a while to scale. That's why we went the optimistic route. Um, or, or Yeah, the optimistic route uh, through optimism. Optimism is very keen to using ZK, te ZK technology too. So I think uh, in the long term, we're going to be just fine um, you know, using that tech stack. So is this going to feel a lot like, you know, transacting on optimism, I would imagine. So when people are asking, you know, they want to get into the minutia of it, if you've transacted on optimism, you know, I, I'm assuming you guys are using a sequencer of some sort. Yeah. I'm assuming there is, you know, the like, because on optimism, you have that lag time until like actual finality because it's an optimistic roll up. So we're right. kind of assuming they're all true unless right. somebody comes in and tells us it's not. You're un smart. Unlike bro. ZK. I had to learn it a while back and I, I remember like a little bit of it. Um, and so and so pretty much that's that's kind of what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can skip that process uh, through bridging um, so people don't have to wait the seven days. Obviously, that's not as secure and you're looking at probably paying a little bit in fees, but at least there's an mm -hmm. option there. But yeah, right. I, I totally agree. Like ZK is the way to go long term and the way that you described it, I couldn't say it any better. Optimism is very smooth and I I've used it quite a bit. I've never had the seven day wait time, but where I have found that to be really beneficial is there was an exploit on optimism a while back and due to that seven day wait time they were able to get in and go er, incorrect let's yep. roll this one back uh in the most simple way that i could possibly put that and uh so that was very very interesting uh so cool man I, dude i'm so fired up now i have a question for you um because like i've been friends with sebastian uh Shepsis for a long time not, not that long, a couple of years. Anyhow, he was one of like the very first projects to launch on Phantom. And I was doing a lot of work on Phantom at the time. And uh, he launched this project called NFT Gem. And then he kind of explained to me a little bit later on that he had something to do with Syscoin. And then we got real close to Double Sharp, who his name's Justin Silver, but he also did a lot of work with you guys on Syscoin. And I'm wondering, like, <clears throat> you guys have a lot of cool shit going on. Oh, and I know you have a lot of smart minds under the hood. But I don't hear a ton about Syscoin like 
in the news or like maybe it may just be my circle like where's what why is that like why is it not, not a more prominent name because it seems like you guys deserve to have a more prominent so name. we're not vc funded like the other guys oh you're it's not in the just, boys club <laughs> you're not in the boys club man and you know we we want to play that game to a certain extent but mm -hmm. we want to maintain our principles as well I mean, from a social media standpoint, I think we do a pretty good job. If you look at our communities, they're very uh, dedicated and sophisticated uh, when it comes to knowledge. But mm -hmm. at the same time, since we've been a coin that's been around since 2014, that hype really isn't there on the retail side. And mm -hmm. I think a lot has to do with narrative. You know, a lot of narrative is pushed with proof of stake, but we talked to a few key players and we can easily spin that narrative back into proof of work. And literally mm -hmm. I see a day where we're talking mostly about Bitcoin, Ethereum and Syscoin because it's like, it's like you're, you're, you're hot and you're cold. You're North and you're South with, with Ethereum and Syscoin. This is that, that sounds sound like a Katy Perry song just there. That was good, man. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> cool, gold. man. Bitcoin, Ooh, Ethereum, I Syscoin. So I want to pull up y'all's Twitter so everyone uh, knows where to find you. It's at Rolex L2. Strongly recommend you follow these guys and turn on notifications like I just did. So you guys have mainnet hitting 28th of June. Is that still June accurate? June 28th. We've got quite a few projects jumping in and then more. I, I see it more as a gradual run up once we kind of prove ourselves and people are seeing like, wow, this is a very cheap blockchain to uh, transact on. They're mm -hmm. going to start flocking over. That is the, um, we're, we're just trying to make it as accessible as possible, right? Because there's a liquidity fragmentation in blockchain. That's a whole nother issue. And we're just trying to make it easier. So that's what we're consistently, consistently going to be working on. And uh, hopefully, you know, it starts to get traction and we start moving up. We've got Sys Labs, which is our for-profit corporation uh, that's building several products. Um, really cool stuff. We've got uh, an app that's literally a Web3 wallet, a chat application, and an AI assistant. We're working on regulation compliance stuff. As we know, that's a huge, huge thing in the industry right now with SEC. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just imagine compliant rollups that governments and enterprises can use. Uh, a lot of different things. So I'm pretty excited at the direction that we're going. And Rolex, of course, you know that public infrastructure that everyone can use. Huge, man. Huge. Thank you so much for breaking that down, dude. That is like freaking, I'm freaking fired up for it. So I look forward to seeing Mainnet go live. And because Alex is the top G, he's hanging out, man. He's going to shoot the shit with yeah, us you're for, gonna a stick around we for got, the rest of our show. We here. got topics. Mikey, I, what are you I, trolling us? Well, no, no, I, I do. I do have one question that I asked um, earlier uh, with okay. Coral and I, I wanted to I wanted to hear maybe Alex describe it or, or answer the question. Anyway. As long as it's not about polynomial numbers. Sure. <laughs> Never mind. Here. See you later. <laughs> I'm, just I'm gonna drink uh, my coffee. So, you know, like a lot of people like, you know, like with the ordinal fab or fad and um, why? Why does Bitcoin need an EVM layer two? You know, this is a good question. Uh, and, and I didn't bring this up. I thought this was going to come up. So I'm glad that you brought it up. It is the ordinals. It's, it's, it's cute, right? It's nice. Like, oh, we, we're doing stuff on top of Bitcoin. But it goes back to the data availability. There is no data availability layer uh, on Bitcoin itself. So that's why you don't really let Bitcoin be Bitcoin. Let it be the, the P2P. Let it be the digital gold. Uh, you, there's ways to leverage the technology without inscribing and messing with all the data and bloating the network and making the fees very expensive. That's my take on it. Here, 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 yeah. here. Good answer, man. But also, there's no smart contract execution. There's no data layer, like you said, on on Bitcoin. Which what that the limitations of that are mind blowing. And and it honestly, like I did not get into the ordinals. I did not get into the BRC twenty phase uh we have a good buddy of ours who does our show on fridays mark who's super duper into it mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but just if ethereum is going to be the world's supercomputer and things are going to be deployed on ethereum right having the ability to secure those assets on top of the, the bitcoin network i see as a massive thing massive thing especially if we get if we go down the dare i say tradfi route 
where there are significant assets that need to be secured in a way that Ethereum can't offer, which, you know, could happen one day. So, agreed. All right, all right, Mikey. Beautiful. Hey, Mike. Everyone, Mikey's moving to El Salvador. By the way, uh, when are you moving? Beach. When are you moving? Bitcoin Beach. Yeah, Bitcoin. he's moving to Bitcoin yeah. Beach. Bitcoin, Bitcoin City. He's gonna get a harem, and he's going to do the show from down there, and, and and we won't see him. We'll just see like one of his random girlfriends pop on the stream during the day. I thought it was haram. <laughs> is it a har- is it a harem? Could be. You want it to be a haram? Is it, it, a harem, whatever you want it to be. Well, I guess it's not actually. Haram is a Islamic term. Haram, haram is when something is not okay, according. Yeah, to you can't it. have too Look. many girlfriends. That's haram, bro. Yeah, <laughs> haram is eating pork. Too late. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. Anymore. All right. Okay. Yeah, all, right, all right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks for let's get, let's get back into it, guys. So I think that was a good uh, good intro to Syscoin, a good uh, statement of value, right? I think we all kind of interested in Rolux now. Um, look at this, Austin. You you wanted me to lead the show. You got all the tabs already open. This is exactly where we're going <sighs> next, though. This is where See we're going you, next. Baby. Yeah. We got to talk about this. So, all right. <clears throat> so we had, we had a CPI that beat. We had a PPI mm-hmm. that beat. Uh, which PPI is is going to be, from what I understand, Powell's favorite metric to go on. Nope, that's PCE. PPI, uh, a little Son bit different. Of a bitch, explain. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is why I can't leave the show. Yeah, dude. Oh, it's all good. That's why I'm here. Uh, PPI, I think, uh, purchasing price index, and then the PCE is personal. I don't know something else. Consumption. I know PCE core is what expenditures. He, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that's what he wants to see go down. Um, okay. So if we look at, look, I got, I got another chart here. So we looked Throw at this up, in the show yesterday Throw a little up. bit. I, I yield my time. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> we looked at this on the show a little bit yesterday. Let me uh, zoom in a little bit here. Uh, this is like CPI broken out into individual like assets or not assets, uh, items, right? So you can see it's kind of complicated. It's a lot more complicated than it's just going down. Some things are going up, some things are going down. But if we just look at uh, everything all at once, let's go. Not that one, this one. Uh, you'll see it is going down. CPI is going down. So by this measure of inflation, we're looking kind of good. Still not where we want to be, but nice downtrend. <clears throat> but if you look at PCE, which we don't have the numbers for last month yet, uh not looking good, dude. <laughs> it's continuing to rise mm. uh, according to last month. So, and, and explain PCE again. And this is the amount that manufacturers are paying. Yeah, I believe this is how much amazing. manufacturers are paying. I think this is actually just a different basket of goods okay. that is being tracked. And I think the reason that the Fed likes this more is that this is less subject to seasonal fluctuations. Uh, so, like, gotcha. if we go back to you know this one here uh and we go by selected items you know we could put like tomatoes oranges and like ground chuck now just because of like seasonal variations ground chuck's going up (laughs) individual industries have individual problems you know maybe there's like a lot of cows dying or whatever so chuck goes up causes inflation on that asset or that that item but pc is more just general like what do you need to live baby like you might swap things out here and there uh because mm-hmm. things are going up but if everything across the board is going up you're done you're toast that means you're getting real inflation and that's, that's what the it. fed's looking out for so if you look at this okay. so oh, he, the, the big theory that we're expecting to see is we're expecting to see a pause today mm-hmm. now whether or not this will be a perma pause or whether or not it's going to be a pause for this meeting and a wait and see nobody really knows but i think the expectation uh is that jay powell is going to come out and say okay we've raised rates enough we're going to keep them here for a little while right which will be seen as a fed pivot mm-hmm. uh and then and of course you know what they actually do at 2 p.m versus what comes out of his mouth at 2 30 p.m like really his speech and the questions that he answers is what's going to matter we should take bets, dude, because I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling strong after my prediction earlier that uh, the pause was like 95, 90% going to mm-hmm. come. And the CME thing, look, they followed me like little ducklings. Like little ducklings. Wait, you want to take a bet? Me. Listen, if you give Let's me nine to one, I'll take I'll take the opposite side. I'll, it says 90%. 
Okay, win yeah. rate on you. Uh, you yeah, gotta give me nine to one yeah, odds, bro. Nine to one. It's gonna be a pause. So I'll take I'll take nine to one on a raise. I know it's gonna be a losing bet, but I'll do it just to to you know. I'll bet you twenty bucks. We, Make, we could add a, a dub ski parlay to this. Um, Alex, what do you think about all this, man? What's your what's your take, man? For giggles, I'll take the nine to one as well. But yeah, I think see, is right. Goes. Let's do it. Ten. Wait, how much is a cis coin going for now? <laughs> <laughs> a little above 12 cents. One cis coin. I'm putting <laughs> one cis coin up. <laughs> um, no withdrawal fees okay. more than that, I'm we'll sure. Go that way. <laughs> I want to see a... Uh, but honestly, though, what, I, what I'm expecting here, I'm interested what you guys think. I'm thinking what's probably going to happen, we're going to pause, we're going to reassess as we go along. Um, obviously, that, that's kind of what my buddy Jerome said last month is that they want to take it a little bit slower now because they've raised it so fast, so high. And as a uh, head of the Jerome Powell fan club, I'm speaking with an expert opinion. It's going to be a pause, probably one more, one or two more rate hikes, but spaced out a lot more over the next coming months. We're probably not going to see any kind of cut until like late this year. If it so happens dealer said, next year. I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. All right, let's let's keep. I'm sorry, <laughs> only sick people get that joke. Uh, all right, so all right, so let's say we get a pause today. Uh, right now, I mean, if you look at the S and P, you look at the Nasdaq, like they're cruising. Uh, and in fact, if you were to go back six months ago, if we would have saw, seen this type of run from the traditional markets, Bitcoin would be absolutely flying right now, and we're not through mm -hmm. regulatory fears or you know, whatever the case may be. But I think over time, it's going to shake that off. Uh, I think, you know, we've got, we've got Warren Davidson introducing the, uh, I forget what the hell it's called. It's basically the restructure of the SEC Act with get rid of Gary Gensler and mm -hmm. uh, get rid of that position, put it under the, the control of a board, things like that. I don't, I don't wear my hat for it. I wear my hat backwards. This is, but it is, this is <laughs> a melon. Much cooler that way. More it's like a an in-house view when you wear it backwards. Yeah, I only go backwards. I, I do have hair. People accuse me of not having hair. Um, <laughs> but so a lot of this plays in because we got the Hinman documents released yesterday, which gave us an inner, like like almost a, a peek behind the curtain of the SEC. And there's some really interesting shit that went on. And I think all of this is going to play a role in how the SEC is approaching uh, the crypto markets. And so do you think we could watch this quick video? So this here, let me throw my screen up real quick. This is a video that was put out by Stuart Alderati. That's a hell of a name. That's a good name. Solid. Uh, and this, this video, <laughs> this video is basically a breakdown of exactly what was found in the Hinman documents. And if anyone is like unsure what that means or like why these were important this is going to break it down for you so let's can we watch this real quick let's get into this i think this is very very useful best 27 minute video you'll ever watch just oh kidding my. It's, it's four minutes <laughs> but it's worth content it. now hold on I let know. me go hey. grab my popcorn real quick yeah, yeah <laughs> dude grab whatever y'all need man get comfy just but it's worth watching check it out on june 14th 2018 then sec director of corporation finance william hinman gave a high-profile speech where he declared that a token is Listed. not a security, becomes, quote, sufficiently decentralized. But internal emails and documents show that senior SEC officials repeatedly warned Hinman that his speech wasn't true to the law and would greatly confuse the markets even more than they already were. Now, after more than two years and seven court orders, we can finally share some of what we found in the Hinman speech documents. The SEC head of trading and markets warned Hinman that he was making up factors that, quote, go beyond the typical Howey analysis, as in not in the law, and that the speech could lead to not just confusion, but greater confusion on what is a security. Hinman ignored him. If the network on which the token or coin is to function is sufficiently decentralized and the purchasers no longer have a reasonable expectation, that a person or a group is going to carry out essential managerial or entrepreneurial efforts, those assets might not represent an investment contract. Uh -oh. Okay, so I want to I want to touch on this real I quick because like this, this guy. was this was <laughs> yeah, dude, he totally went off the rails. Boy. So uh, this actually was in the recent um, <clears throat> discussion draft that was put forth from Patrick McHenry, where he said if a network is certified as decentralized, because that's part of 
what his draft said is you can you can actually get certified as, as decentralized then the tokens that live with on that network will have a much easier time getting classified as a commodity very interesting very interesting all right let's keep watching this for a little bit let's see what the same official told hinman he should tie his speech quote more closely and explicitly to the howie analysis hinman not only ignored him but okay. deliberately created factors beyond those identified by the supreme court in the howie case i wanted to just note a few things this list is not meant to be exhaustive but these are things that we look at the sec's own general counsel warned specifically that it's legally irrelevant if someone retains a stake in a token and is motivated to take action to increase its value and that Hinman should delete it from the speech. And once again, Hinman ignored them he and said rogue. without any legal support that it was important to ask. Has that person or group retained a stake in, or other interests in the digital assets such that it would be motivated to expend efforts to cause an increase in the value of the digital asset? Both trading and markets and the general counsel also disagreed with Hinman's belief that if a network was sufficiently decentralized, information asymmetries would no longer exist noting that a network creator would likely have more information than a retail holder, using Vitalik Buterin as an example. They warned Hinman that by creating this, quote, other category and focusing on information asymmetries, he was exposing a regulatory gap that the SEC may not have the jurisdiction to fill. Again, Hinman ignored them. As the network becomes more truly decentralized, <laughs> the ability to even to identify a promoter or to make I the requisite someone that could actually make the requisite disclosures becomes in many cases difficult or um, and perhaps much less meaningful. On June 4th, Hinman wrote that he didn't see a quote need to regulate Ether as a security and set up a call with Ethereum's co-founder Vitalik Buterin later oh, that I week see. to quote confirm uh -huh. our understanding. We're getting into it now. On June yeah, 11th, Buterin. the SEC's own general counsel advised against including any direct statement about Ether in the speech because it would be difficult for the SEC to quote take a different position on Ether in the future. The next day, trading and markets wrote that the statements about Ether were quote likely to create more confusion. Hinman ignored all of them and decided to make headlines picking winners and losers instead. Moreover, putting aside the fundraising that accompanied the creation of Ether, based on my understanding of the present state of Ether, the Ethereum network, its decentralized structure, we believe current offers and sales of Ether are not securities transactions. Mm -hmm. The emails show that Hinman knew he wasn't following the law. He knew he was making... All right, we've gotten... I think we've gotten far enough into it that we've gotten the juice... Chewy, we were paid a hundred thousand dollars by Ripple to only show this video. Yeah, this video was made by the Ripple <laughs> lawyer, right? Like, it was I'm made pretty, by you somebody. The narrator? No, I but mean, here, here's what well, the, the Ripple here, lawyer posted this, right? Here's what we've got to infer from this, because later on, what's going to happen is Jay Clayton is going to say, "Well, Bill Hinman gave a great speech. I I refer you to it to see what mm -hmm. we consider a security or what we consider a commodity." Interestingly enough, the theory that's coming out is that Hinman was making backroom deals with the Ethereum Foundation mm -hmm. and that, you know, I don't want to, you know, say he was on the take, but that's kind of what people are saying because he completely went against whatever the SEC told him to do because he needed to come out and document that Ether was not a security that he needed to do so. And so oh, how does this play into the Ripple case? Because there was a there was a one charge that was levied against Brad Garlinghouse and uh, David Schwartz? Oh man, I'm screwing up names. Um, but that was basically that they had reckless disregard for, for the law, for the securities laws. And part of their defense is nobody fucking knows what they are. Uh, we just don't know what they are. And what yeah. this shows is that in 2018, neither did the SEC. And well, XRP's have been around since like 2013. I don't know, man. It seems like there was a lot of like <clears throat> contention inside the SEC. Because he's got his lawyer saying like, look, man, you shouldn't say this. <laughs> like, don't say this. Like, this is not our policy. Don't say this. And Hinman just said it anyway. Again, Hinman ignored them. Yeah, exactly. Now, Again, if, it was just, them. if it was just Hinman, though then it could have been okay. But the problem is you have the SEC chairman referring back to the Hinman speech 
as guidance. And then the SEC put that speech on their website. Yeah, That's I, what puts them in a jackpot. I feel like the cat was like out of the bag. So the chairman had to be like, well, fuck, man. I can't make it look like I don't have control over my guys. I got I to gotta co-sign this. Maybe. I, mean, I, don't know his, I don't know his motivation. Maybe he was on the take too. Because I don't know. If I was the lawyer who was like making these suggestions and he just ignored all my suggestions, I'd probably just like resign. I'd be like, this this thing is, is done. I, I, <laughs> um, We're out of here. But there... Because like it's saying, the uncertainty that he introduced with this speech seems to be like why we're in this position now. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the SEC would have been able to just, you know, make the rules. Um, but I guess he does by creating that regulatory gap. I guess it is favorable for our industry because it's saying that the securities laws are not sufficient. To, exactly. To and handle. that's what this tweet kind of outlaw outlines. This is Paul Graywall. He's chief legal officer at Coinbase. And he says. The regulatory gap proof from the Hinman emails of what we've been saying to the Third Circuit, to Congress and to SEC, that the securities laws are incomplete when it comes to digital assets. And what's especially interesting about this is in 2021, Gary Gensler himself said the securities laws are incomplete to regulate digital assets. I implore Congress to give me, you know, particular guidance. He changed his tune mm -hmm. back in you know, at the beginning of 2022, when they started just railing against these companies. Did you guys see the tweet? Oh, I got to find it now. It was absolute gold from library yesterday. Oh, yeah, we should have. We should have. We I got have it. I them. got it, dude. It is like it would be way better. It is literally one of the, the greatest tweets uh, that I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, here it is. Really regretting that we didn't bribe the SEC like Ethereum did. If you get the chance to bribe government officials, please do it. It's worth every penny. <laughs> like, yes, dude. This is the shit. Savage. This is the best. That's so brutal, um, man. So where are we, though, with all of this? I mean, this gave us a little bit of insight, but I don't think it's a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination. And like... My gut tells me the best we can hope for in the XRP case is like some of the things are thrown out, you know, maybe not a full win in the sense that, you know, they overcome on every single charge, but like the, hey, you couldn't have possibly followed these laws because nobody ever gave you any guidance. Like if we mm -hmm. actually get that in a court document, you know, it could force the hand of the SEC because they just came forward and said they need another 120 days or something on the Coinbase thing. You know? Yeah, they just keep kicking the can down the road. That's um, what doing. It does seem like, uh, I mean, I've said it before, and I think this is the common consensus that this is just like them trying to claim ground, the SEC trying to claim ground because they don't have really, like they're struggling to come up with like specific rules because they don't want to paint themselves into a corner, but they're already like in a corner. Uh, and they want mm -hmm. to seem like they want to, that they're taking serious actions in the wake of FTX. I saw a YouTube video about it. This great expression I haven't heard in a while. It's like them trying, they're they're closing the barn door after the horse has already bolted. Like FTX already happened and they missed their chance. Even mm -hmm. though Gensler was all cozied up to them, he for some reason couldn't see the problem right in front of his face. Well, do you, you know, know why? Well, you're going you to say he's greasing their palms? No. Well, maybe. But his boss at MIT mm -hmm. was Caroline Ellison's father. Hmm there's they're complete it's an incestual whole thing there so the wow. fact that he got in front of gear Gensler was not by chance it was not because he was a huge downer it was because he had the connections that's the reason that a no action letter was even being discussed ah and so that that tweet from um old boy what's his name sbf saying i'll have some things for my old sparring partner referring to cz this is him getting his girlfriend's dad's <laughs> lackey to, ta to tackle my <clears throat> Yeah, but you know, thing. like none of none of the executives at um, FTX were like particularly charismatic. Maybe they were smart mm -hmm. uh, to some degree, but like you look at Sam, I want to call him Sam Tabasco, Sam Trabuco. <laughs> like if you ever watch the dude, I couldn't even get through like 15 minutes of a video of him because it's just like, my God, this guy. But you look at Caroline Ellison and and when she took over as ceo cuz when he stepped away they were co-ceos when she took over as ceo this is before the debacle happened and she starts taking to twitter and doing all this weird shit and i'm going 
the fuck? Why is she in this position? Like, why? What qualifies her to be there? Mm -hmm. Lineage. Lineage qualified her to be there. And, Production. you know, they worked at Jane Street together and they had, you know, some history. That's how they came to be. But anyhow, it's mm -hmm. uh, you're right, Nick. We cannot make this shit up, my friend. So where do we stand? Thoughts? Alex, what do you think? I think it's all theater, man. A, mm. a great, a great man. I think his name was Austin. I saw a tweet from him the other day. It's like, what do they do? First, they fight you. You want, you want to finish that one? First, they <sighs> fight you. Then that was misattributed to me. I did not actually say that. <laughs> Neither did Gandhi. Actually, I don't know who the hell said it, but you know, I do think we're in the fight you stage. Thank you for, thank you for your patronage. Yeah, I, 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 I think you. that's where we're at, and they are going <laughs> to essentially try to way, try to find a way to just get involved and take over so uh, in in between all this we've got all this content all this theater to consume and talk about all the world's a stage my friend true true absolutely let's talk realistically though realistically what do you think crypto is going to be i mean because it's going to be regulated right like you can't have markets existing right. that are just operating willy-nilly that's probably not going to happen they're going to at least want to get effective taxation going but mm -hmm. if they can't peg it as a security, um, are they really going to modify existing securities laws to incorporate crypto? Like they're going to be ex specifically in the case of crypto? Because I have an idea. I'm asking a leading question because I, I have an idea. Well, what it sounded like from my understanding is they would give us a definition. And that definition actually has a lot to do with the token sale that was done, mm -hmm. how, how the token is distributed, how much money you actually collected and who you collected it from and, and what network it lives on, right? So those are some things. But from what I understand is if there are some tokens which are deemed securities, there's going to be a window to come into compliance and a clear roadmap exactly how you can do that. It may not be easy. It's going to require like a lot of reporting and things of that nature from, from what I understand from the bill. Um, but it at least exists. And it'll it'll you know probably spurn an entirely new new industry in the law profession of all right let's get you into compliance here in this particular way, so at least it has to exist. That's the problem. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think I think you're right. I mean they they're gonna have to have some kind of regulation right to 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 make this function. But I think they're really wanting to prevent crypto's integration into the existing financial markets in any significant way. So I think, honestly, what they're really going to try and do, anything that's really realistically going to get passed, is if they can't shut it down through the current SEC actions. Because what it seems like is it's it, this is directly like the SEC trying to shut down the crypto industry as much as possible. Silo it off, cut it off, push it off. Let, let's take a step back and talk about the technology side of things, because that affects, there's an effect there. Mm -hmm. Because the whole Ethereum proof of stake move from proof of work to proof of stake that that was a whole narrative shift right and what did that effectively entail well now with these proof of stake you've got all these validators mm -hmm. maybe the governments are trying to infiltrate that system where they're controlling a bunch of these validators and at the end of the day that'll allow them to block certain transactions from coming through which i believe you know, Coinbase and a few other ones can already do with their va validating set. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah, I mean that that seems fairly realistic to me too. I mean, if there's Those anyone that's got enough, right? Yeah, if there's anyone that's got enough uh, money to just build a massive farm of validators to fifty one percent attack, it would be you know governments, nation states, right? So that that is true. That is a big attack vector that I think a lot of people kind of overlook. Well, I don't even I don't even think it's necessarily an attack vector that would be publicly known. I think it's the same way that they're reading your text messages. You're not going to know it. It's just going to happen. And I think that's kind of what Alex is saying is it's a way for them to infiltrate. And that was another theory that was put forth mm -hmm. is that, that Gensler, we know he's in the pocket of the banks. We know that he's a Warren disciple, that bitch. Uh, and so, you know, it, it could be that he's trying to do away with the incumbents to allow the trad five friends to come on in and take over that's that was another theory that was put forth that actually does make a lot of sense mm -hmm. you know yeah i mean that makes a lot of sense to me too and i mean 
what would they would do with it? I mean, like, what would be the end of that? I suppose is the real question. Is it just to to have greater control, censorship control, control over the system? I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that they have over banks, you know, like they can freeze your bank account, they can roll back transactions, all that sort of thing. Um, Indeed. Definitely, definitely possible. But but there is like, I guess the there's like very low barriers to like get in and out of different crypto networks right like you could just bridge around like crazy so would, would just controlling just say like ethereum really shut it all down the whole system down i guess possibly if it's fully infiltrated what do you what do you think alex i mean what what about all these other chains i mean most of it's proof of stake stuff so mm -hmm. they can get control of those you want to get control of phantom you want to get control of uh freaking cardano Solana, it's mm -hmm. not that difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to agree. I think it, I think it's something that that could easily be done, and it could it could honestly easily be done by <clears throat> we're going to shut you down, or you're going to put a backdoor in your next firmware update. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Uh, you remember in Silicon Valley that show? You ever see it where the Chinese kid he he goes back to Chinese like doing Chinese Jin Reddit and China, yeah yeah Chinese mm -hmm. Facebook, but he's got to put a backdoor in all of them. Because that's what the government required. And yeah. I, I can see that, you know, completely. I can see that completely being the case uh, with this. So uh, honestly, Wally, like, even though I don't interact a lot with proof of work networks, I would I would tell you that in my heart, as somebody that mined for a while, and I like understand the intricacies of it, I would say proof of work is hands down the best way to secure a network. The Syscoin plug right here, <clears throat> you can use proof of work network with a, a proof of stake experience or an ethereum experience it's, it's simple try us out i have a lovely amd 5700 here if anyone wants it <laughs> I'll, I'll, i should probably sell it on ebay man the ai boys are going nuts for that shit right now That's but true. uh but but listen i i think i think a lot of the move like you understand that the white house right now is saying climate change is our big existential threat like we're all gonna fucking burn up and die california is gonna be underwater florida is just gonna we're all gonna drop into the center of the earth because whatever right it's a narrative there's always a narrative they never actually happen um <clears throat> but i i do believe also that ethereum may have kowtowed to that narrative you know i i think that was a big push Absolutely. and like the entire bitcoin network I, I read this the other day. It uses less than the equivalent of the the clothes dryers, like your your washer and dryers, in the United States. Hi, Mikey. Good to see you. Mikey popped in. Mikey's a part of the show now. He just comes Continue. and he goes. Continue, because I have something to say about this. Okay, cool. Well, you should just be a co-host. We'll just keep you on. No, no, no. Mike. I like pop, I like popping in. I like popping in. <laughs> that was a cool so, in. so this is this is something to where the actual impact of Bitcoin is so absolutely minuscule, and then they have ways of refeeding back into the electrical grid to actually make it more supportive of the grid. Um, that it it is completely a non-issue unless you watch mainstream media and let them impregnate you with the ideas that they, they need you, you know, they hypnotize you with COVID. They hypnotize you with vaccines. They hypnotize you with climate change. And I use a condom. And, so. <laughs> and, and, my, and Mikey's condoms. So, I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is go ahead, Mikey. I'm interested. Well, so, so you got, you got on the topic about, uh, and I don't want to like take away too much from the conversation, but you got into the topic of, uh, you start talking about, uh, climate change and Bitcoin. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions about Bitcoin and its energy, cons its energy consumption is that it actually, what does it do? It, it incentivizes green energy. It incentivizes, uh, like, like, you know, people love mining Bitcoin and they're going to try to use, or, or they're going to try to develop a way to do it as green as possible because it's, yes. it's cheaper, for, because it's cheaper for them to Great do point. it. As yeah, green as it's getting more renewable every year. Right. Exactly. Mm. That's an You're excellent welcome. point. Thank you, Mikey. Yeah, you just show up, you drop heat, and then you leave, man. I pop in. I pop in. I feel so used. I pop out. Mikey Smash and Dash. That's what we're going to call him. Oh, so Mikey we're proof of work, Max, now? 
Well, yes. No, pr- listen, proof yes. of work is proof of work. Pr- green, green probably look the safest solar power proof of work. Here, here's my solar. Power. Here's my my thought process. There's nothing wrong with proof of stake in the right area. Mm-hmm. Like with these L2s, decentralized sequencing. If you need governance, you need proof of stake. Totally fine. But the court system should be that layer one. The consensus system. That's where you should really be as secure as possible and be using proof of work. Mm-hmm. And for anyone that doesn't know what merge mining is, that's essentially where you can, like for, in your instance, you turn on the SHA-256 algo, you point it towards a particular, like let's say mining pool or whatever, and you're mining Bitcoin and Syscoin at the exact same time, right? And no, a little we, bit of that hash power is being diverted towards Syscoin or how exactly does no, that No, no hash power. We're just, um, we just have the hash rate. So we've got about 20 to 30% at any given time of the global hash rate. Uh, Bitcoin, meaning 20 to 30 percent of people who mine Bitcoin are mining Syscoin. Uh, okay. Another example of merge mining, uh, RSK, R- Rusk, Risk, I don't know. And then uh, Dogecoin actually is merge mined, but with Litecoin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's here, a fairly uh, well-known concept <clears throat> in tech. Satoshi talked about it, not on the white paper, but on one of the forums. Right. Um, you know, imagine if you were to build Ethereum all over again, you just merge mine it. Merge mine. Oh, yeah. So I, I found a really interesting tweet from this guy. On okay. a, I don't I don't even know who this guy is. William William Mogayer. Mogayer. Mogayer? Mogayer. Bill <laughs> Bill Mogayer. He's the author of the business blockchain token summit on coins.com. But he says six recent small wins from the crypto industry. And these these are something. So the SEC wants 120 days to respond to Coinbase's rulemaking deadline. We talked about that. Shows the SEC is stalling and felt cornered. Judge ruled the SEC cannot shut down Binance US. And that's our next little topic. Uh, and asked that both parties compromise on a solution. The Hinman emails revealed that the SEC did not follow through on the path he opened for allowing some tokens to be classed as non-securities, showed he had tacit approval. I need to Google that word later, but no follow-up. Uh, financial committee hearing on clarity and digital assets went well. GOP majority whip revealed that Gary Gensler told Congress last year, 2021 or 2022, excuse me, he needed legislation to regulate the digital asset industry. Yet this year, he's saying he doesn't need it. Oopsie on that one. Uh, in 2018, a Gary Gensler video surfaced with him saying BTC, ETH, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, which, by the way, at the point that he made that statement, those were all proof of work networks, to be fair, uh, that are they're not securities. And last week, Caitlin Long's Custodia Bank was allowed to pursue Fed supervision membership via other channels despite the Federal Reserve's objections. Is the SEC blinking? Maybe. Is the U.S. industry winning? Maybe. Small wins matter. I wouldn't count the chickens yet, but this all points to the industry's fight is worthy. And quick plug for Across the Chains, Mark Jeffrey is going to have Caitlin on uh, this Friday to talk about Custodia Bank. Oh, yeah. So the word, lots the word, going- tacit, the word tacit means understood or implied without being stated. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Okay. See, learn something new every if day. you got anything from this show, you got that. You got the word tacit. So we talked about Binance US. Mm -hmm. And so the SEC went for the jugular. Uh, They went for a complete freeze of all of the trading platforms assets. And this was a small win, but a win nonetheless, because in the past, a lot of judges have just straight up said, well, you're the SEC and you're some scammy crypto guys and we're just going to go with the SEC. Uh, And the federal judge overseeing the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's case against Binance and Binance U.S. declined to order a temporary restraining order freezing the U.S. trading platform's assets. Representatives of Binance U.S. said they mainly wanted to be allowed normal operating expenses and that they were not willing to accept the death penalty represented by a total asset freeze. Yep. So they, they told them, they said, go on back get us a list of what normal operating expenses are. Now, I found this to be kind of interesting, this securities versus commodities part. So Judge Jackson, not Reverend Jackson, also dove into the foundational question at the heart of the suit. What makes a crypto asset a security and is it a commodity if it isn't a security? Though the judge asked some elementary questions about the issue, she was not satisfied with the answers. Near the opening of the hearing, the judge asked SEC attorneys to distinguish between a crypto asset and a crypto asset security. 
SEC attorney Matthew Scarlato told the judge that the regulator had provided several examples of cryptos it believed were securities in the broader complaint. So they just re referred you back to the complaint. We're not going to tell you what it is, but here's a list of the ones that we say are. But was also reserving the right to assess the rest of the tokens on the exchanges later. The judge asked the SEC and later Binance whether the other cryptocurrencies were commodities. The ones that they, I don't know, you're not calling securities. What are they? She asked, diving into the issue. She later asked if BNB is a commodity since the company had argued it was, I think they mean wasn't, a security. It is a crypto asset, Martin mm -hmm, said. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. <clears throat> and I get the feeling that there will be so much precedent set in the next year or two where the SEC is spinning plates everywhere. And granted, they're a big organization. They're well-funded. But one fuck up that gets precedent set is going to be used by the entire industry, right? Or one, one big win for them is also going to be unfortunate for the industry. And I think the good news that we have here is that at least the at least one side of Congress is is firmly in the crypto is good camp, um, you know. So for now, as long as it's well, politically listen, convenient. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Whether it's a Republican talking point because it wins the younger voter, or whether it is something they actually believe in, I don't know. Robert F. You know Kennedy Jr., who's running for president, firmly believes in in Bitcoin and the right to have sovereign money. And he's also a kind of guy that's operating out of the system because what gives a government power? Like they say that the people give them power. That's not true. The money gives them power. The money is what gives them power. And you are directly threatening their power if they don't have control over this new form of money. End of story. True, true. You know, technically it's the monopoly on violence that gives the government power, but <laughs> the money. Well, you got to have the money. The, the, money the financial warfare that. happens before the real warfare does. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's true. Um, you got to pay soldiers is basically what it boils down to. But yeah, there's I a whole flow so. chart to the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. no, they they put people into they the United States commits financial terrorism, period. End of story. They do that. They put other countries indebted um, into a place of subservience to continue the use of the United States dollar as the reserve currency like that shit happens. And mm -hmm. when you get world leaders that start to question that or move outside of that i don't know how much we're doing today yeah alex knows man they come after you if if it's someone they can squash easily if it's china and india and all these guys and the BRICS, well now they're banding together they're like a union they're like saying you know hell no we won't go mm -hmm. burning the bras and things like that yeah and that's kind of <laughs> um why crypto's in this risky little position isn't it uh mm -hmm. because it lifts that little bit of control um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that the reason why, uh, you know, this is really ramping up recently is because, uh, and I think we touched on it earlier in a, in a previous episode, is that the idea that the U.S. wants to have as tight a control over the monetary system as possible, specifically right now with the geopolitical situation that's playing out, both in Russia, Ukraine, and in China. So loosening they want to make the dollar as powerful as possible. And if crypto is a way to get out of the dollar and easily transfer value to other currencies through other stable coins or to other assets, not something they really want to see happening. So they're just trying to jam this up right now. That's why I'm kind of like hesitant to say like anyone really believes in, in politics right now. Anyone has really any strong feelings about being truthful or honest about what they actually want to classify crypto assets are, as they don't, they may not actually believe them to be commodities or securities. They truly probably occupy that gray area in the middle, but to achieve our current political needs, uh, it needs to be shut down is kind of how the government's viewing it. I think. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I don't think it's going to be hello, my friends. Yep. I probably am going to get, so to, to end, you know, the episode on an interesting note, Yellen finally admits the inevitable. She said, expect a slow decline of the United States as the reserve currency. They're kind mm -hmm. of like, it's almost like this was <laughs> the point. It's almost like, I don't know. Was it all, I hate to be the conspiracy theory guy, but like, I totally am. Like, it's almost like they we scripted are. this shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, dude. Wait, we got to hear a movie this, about this, this pretty soon. 
Does she there actually will be. say uh, expect quality of life to decrease as people pillage what they can? Or is that his is that his commentary? Uh, no, no, no. I think that's his. Do you want to watch the video real quick? Uh yeah, let's see. Yeah, watch the video because I want to hear All right. this. All right. Oh, Mikey's back. Mikey. Hi, Mikey. How you doing, dude? I pop in. I pop in. I'm a popper. And taking that into consideration and be more thoughtful uh, as we may be creating a paranoia around the world where people are listening so quiet. to currencies. To do Turn it up, Boston. I know. I, I can't. I don't think I can get it any higher, dude. Um, as high as it goes, I'm sorry. They can be the subject of those sanctions um, are motivated to look for um, other tools other than the dollar to engage in transactions. Mm -hmm. So but even that's our something friends... we have to accept. It, it, it is um, much more difficult to find other um, tools to make payments, other currencies, when we work jointly with But, but we even partners. have our friends like France also looking for other currencies well, and pushing it. You know, France and some of our allies were not happy when um, we pulled out of JCPOA and imposed sanctions, and um, the, but there, I, I would say there is virtually no meaningful um, workaround uh, for most countries for using the dollar as a reserve currency. Very well, and and I understand your earlier you made it, you made some statements about it being the most stable option with rule of law and liquidity and all yes. that. But isn't it the fact that uh, the use of the dollar has diminished and, and gone down against competing currencies over the years? There's been some increase in holdings of other reserve assets, but that's something to be expected uh, in a growing world economy where there so is a desire to diversify, but So we should still expect less reliance. use of the dollar, is what you're saying? We, we should expect... We, we should expect in over time gradually in, increased share of other assets in reserve holdings of countries. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. So for, for also, you're muted. Know, she, she, Dude. Uh, Janet Yellen mentioned muted. that the uh, JCPOA that people were mad we pulled out of that. The JCPOA is uh the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action to ensure that Iran's nuclear program will be exclusively peaceful. Mm. Interesting. Oh, yeah. So she's saying that's why France is trying to transact another currencies? Come on, get real. Get real. You know what they're pissed about? We domesticated French fries. They're still mad about that <laughs> shit, man. They're still pissed off about it. Freedom fries. Well, all right. So, yeah, this is, this is a reasonable thing to assume. And the more sanctions, the more the United States tries to be the bully. And they that they, they are the bully through financial sanctions. I mean, let's call it what it is. And like the more countries are going to be pushed in a different direction. And eventually enough of them are going to join together. I don't know when it's going to happen, but eventually enough of them are going to join together that the power that they hold will be sufficient to dethrone. I think it'll happen. Yeah. No, nah, it's impossible, dude. What are they going to do? What are You're, they gonna do? I know you don't believe that. You put you have the chart of the various reserve currencies. Look. They start using these other reserve currencies. Look, the only uh, the point of having to being the world reserve currency is you get to bully people around. So it's like you just get to pick who your bully is if you're switching to different reserve currencies. Um, the only answer, really, I'm thinking it's Bitcoin, guys. Now that's one that won't bully you. You use Bitcoin, what's it going to do? I don't know. Michael Saylor might bully. Michael Saylor can bully us. Michael Saylor can bully. Yeah, us. you're right. Michael Saylor All could right. decide my import policy. <laughs> Yo, I have a it's call in like here. a couple minutes. I got a jet. I got to get off of this thing. I apologize to all of you. I just figured well, I would say it publicly. All good. Well, <laughs> I had a fun time on this show. Thank you, Alex, for joining it. us. Man, um, I'm absolutely honored to be on this show. It was wow, a fantastic time. Uh, great to have you, bud. Great yeah, to have man. you. Yeah, Appreciate great you. You're welcome back anytime. Time. Oh, I'll, I'll take that for sure. Open door. Open door. That's Open right. door policy. I like yeah, that, guys. Be sure to like us, subscribe to us, uh, follow <laughs> us, all the whole shebang. Uh, what else I got to say, Austin? Uh, go to the Discord. I got a million. I got a million calls to action for everybody in the chat. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, make sure you I'll follow. All a good of time. Them. Yeah, That's do it. it all, dude. Hit follow us on all socials. Retweet us on all socials. Retruth us everything. And uh, this is Corval signing off. Thanks again, Alex Cisco and Austin. Great time doing a show with you guys. Likewise. Badios.
We out. You guys. Later, y'all.